Well, good morning. It's Happy New Year. It's all good. So excited. Being uh, 2018, fresh beginnings, new year, new you, all that kind of good stuff. All right, before I go any further and, and all that kind of thing, I want to um, give you a report on food stock. Um, yesterday, we sorted and, and boxed and did all that kind of stuff. Thank you for all those who came and, and helped do that and got all of that food over to the food bank. And um, so I wanted to give you a tally on how we did. So here's the deal. We ended up with 12 pallets of food, which equated to 9,794 pounds of food, which provides 7,534 meals to people in our community. And um, so grateful and thankful for all of you for making this happen, for seeing the need in this community, for being uh, Jesus to people who are food insecure and to families and children. And uh, this is going to be great for Martha and the Food Bank as um, they're able to distribute food at a time when usually their cupboards are bare. And um, now they're going to be able to help people as they go through January and February. So good job. Thank you, Cornerstone, for doing that. Really well done. So excited to be able to um, practically help people with the love of Jesus Christ in our community. So, yeah, new year. I'm sure that uh, maybe there's some new resolutions being made among this crowd and, um, you know, you've got the ab sizer on order. You've got buns of titanium videos coming. You've got, you know, the ab crunch is going to start happening. You're going to save 100% of your income. You're thinking of making goals that will actually be something that will stretch us and yet that we can reach our good things. I always think about that um, SMART goals. Have you ever heard of that? S-M-A-R-T, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, and time-bound. So if you're going to make goals, make them that way, SMART goals, specific, measurable, achievable, realistic, time-bound. That would be a great way to do that. And, you know, then when you set your goal, then you have to have a plan, right, of how you're going to reach that goal. And then, you know, you gotta, you got to have some sort of action that has to take place. You actually have to do something to achieve your goal. Did you know that? You actually have to do something. So you're going to have to do something to achieve that goal and all that kind of stuff. But, um, and, and probably even more important than just that little process right there is just um, – Begin with the end in mind. That's a Stephen Covey thing, I think, one of those seven habits. If you can begin with the end in mind, like having a dream or a vision of what you want to see happen. If that's for your life specifically, if you're not happy with, I don't know, how you look right now, well, what's the vision of what you want to look like by the end of all this work that you're going to do? Or, you know, if saving money is a big deal, what do you want that to look like by the end? I think that starting at the beginning with a vision or some sort of imagination of what that can look like and then working towards that helps motivate us to change. You know, it helps motivate us to actually want to do things. So I'm saying all that, not just for you personally, um, but also just to get us started thinking about what we're going to be talking about over the next few weeks of really what does it mean to to have a goal or a vision and to make that happen in our life? What does it mean to look ahead and see something that we want to see done, whether it's individually or corporately as a church, and then actually see that fulfilled? We're going to be dealing with that bigger idea um, as we go throughout the next several weeks. Uh, One of the the, uh, companies that's really good at doing this is Disney. Disney is like the king of, of doing what we were just talking about right there. How many of you went to Walt Disney World or Disneyland or some Disney theme park this year? How many of you did that? No, 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 keep them up. I'm really curious about how many went this year. Like, this seemed like a lot of people did. How many of you have ever been to Disney World, Disneyland, any of Disney theme parks? I don't know if that's everybody or not. We went one time with the boys. That was good enough. <clears throat> Every now and again, when we're looking back at pictures when our boys were little, we come across the picture of taking them to Disney and my mother-in-law in there, and it was 98,000 degrees that day, and poor Will looks like he's just passed out. He's like burnt red, you know, and sweaty, and I was like, yeah, we, we did good one day. One day was good. We, that was great. Anyway, Disney, you know, really is amazing in terms of how they're able to take an idea and actually make it happen, like take one of their movies and turn it into something real. And the way that they do that is even more interesting. They have a group that that works on that called Imagineers. And they do something called Imagineering throughout the year. And this is a group of big thinkers and dreamers and actual engineers who come together to have a, a big dream about what the next thing is going to be at one of their parks or one of their resorts, you know. And 
And so they sit around and dream up these big ideas. Engineers then actually make it happen. And uh, it's really kind of this cool process. If you go to their website, it says, the name Imagineering combines imagination with engineering. Building upon the legacy of Walt Disney, Imagineers bring art and science together to turn fantasy into reality and dreams into magic. So that's kind of how they do this big thing that they do and everything that you see at Disney was well thought out and all this kind of stuff. Well, okay, so we have our own term for what we're going to be talking about. It's called visioneering, and we didn't make up that word, and it's not really a word, but it's a kind of a cool thought. And so visioneering would be the whole idea of taking like a vision and figuring out how to make it happen, actually making a process, the process of engineering a vision. How can we take an idea for our life or for the church or for whatever and actually see it come to fruition? What would be a process that we can make that work? So we're actually starting a series today called Visioneering that we're going to talk about over the next several weeks. Now, take your card, if that card that you received when you came in this morning, and I hope that from now on, if you've always come by the person at the door and said no thank you to the card, don't say that anymore. Take the card because every week is going to be something different. It's going to be relevant. Um, we actually put on there the, uh, the message series that we're going to be in. We've got the big idea there, burden leads to prayer, which leads to action, which we'll talk about today. Our key verses are going to be from Nehemiah, which I'll get into in just a minute. And then we'll always have these questions. And uh, today you can see the questions there, and I'll ask those at the end of the message. The, the point of having a card like this is so that you will be able to take this away. Maybe you could use this as a part of your own spiritual growth and discipleship. You know, read back through these verses, literally write down on here answers to these questions just to kind of help motivate all of us to take steps in our faith and growth. If you're a, a small group leader, community group leader, you might want to use this uh, through your small group process. So I uh, wanted to offer that to you today, but you can kind of see on there every week where we're heading with the message. And uh, so there won't be any gray area about what we're doing. So there's that. So in order to talk about this whole idea of visionary, one of the quintessential books of the Bible that you have to go to is the book of Nehemiah. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and turn there right now. It's sandwiched right there in between Ezra and Esther, two of your favorite books, so it shouldn't be hard to find. Just go right there in the Old Testament, easy, greasy. You know. So um, Nehemiah is one of the greatest visioneers that we read about in the Bible. He's the one who, who had a burden for Jerusalem. He's the one in went in and rebuilt the city of Jerusalem, uh, specifically the wall around Jerusalem. He's the one that went in and and instituted societal and religious reform among the people of Jerusalem. Um, he established uh, getting back the people of God back to worshiping in the temple and, and doing all the things that they should have been doing, and, and you'll see what was happening in just a minute. But, but that's the guy that we want to talk about in, in terms of thinking about this whole idea. And, and you know, for um, Nehemiah, I think about this truth that everybody ends up somewhere in life. Like, that's true, right? Everybody ends up somewhere in life. All of us. And for Nehemiah, Nehemiah ended up somewhere in life on purpose. Nehemiah ended up somewhere in life on purpose. It wasn't like he just randomly stepped forward and did something in his life. He ended up there on purpose, which is a message to all of us that we certainly want to end up where God wants us to be with our life. We want to end up there on purpose. And, and uh, so for him, it was this burden to go to Jerusalem and and uh, carry this whole thing out. So, like, the way that the process worked, I'm going to go ahead and give you the heads up now on what we're going to talk about for these next three weeks is he had a burden, there was a process, and he made it come to fruition. So, we're going to be talking about burden, process, and fruition over these next three weeks and uh, how that relates to us personally, how that relates to us corporately as a church, all these kinds of things. And uh, this morning, specifically, we're going to talk about what does it look like to have uh, a burden. But... Um, so before we start reading the book of Nehemiah, you really need to understand what's happening, uh, some background on that. Now look, if you're not a big history buff, this might be a little painful for you for the next couple of minutes, so, but I want you with me. You need to be with me so that we can all understand these next several weeks together, okay? Are you with me? Okay, I believe that you're with me, so we're going to go ahead. <clears throat> so remember King Solomon, one of the primary kings of Israel? Um, after the reign of King Solomon, and I'm going to be doing a 30,000-foot view of history here, so don't panic. But after the reign of King Solomon, Israel was split into two kingdoms. The northern kingdom, which was called Israel, and the southern kingdom, which was called Judah. Does this ring a bell? Any biblical history coming to mind at this point? Okay, so we've got these two kingdoms. The northern kingdom didn't fare very well in their own history. They had evil king after evil king after wicked king after evil king. So it was really hard for them. They eventually were conquered 
in 722 by the Assyrians. So the Assyrians come in, they conquer the, uh, the northern part of Israel, they take the Israelites, they, they capture them, bring them into slavery, they exile them to areas all around that part of the world in that day. So it's not a good situation. Uh, the southern kingdom only fared a little bit better. They had wicked king and then a godly king and then a wicked king and a godly king, and so that's kind of how their history was going. A uh, hundred and thirty-six years after the fall of the northern kingdom, uh, the southern kingdom fell to the Babylonians. So the Babylonians come in, conquer the southern kingdom, do the same thing, enslave the people, exile them, deport them all over that region. So um, for a while, uh, Babylon reigned in that area. Eventually, Persia comes in. They conquer that area and set up the Persian Empire and um, dominate that, that whole area, conquer the Babylonians and the whole thing. Now, here we go. You get to the end of the book of 2 Chronicles in the Bible, and you see something very important happen here. King Cyrus, who's the king of Persia in that day, moved by God, decides to allow a certain part of the Jews that were in exile to go back to Judah so they can go back to Jerusalem so that they can rebuild the temple and bring honor to their people. So this is a big deal. This is an important move in, in, in Israel's history. And uh, so some people start to go back to Jerusalem, who had not been there in a long time, to, to sort of assess what was going on. Um, Jerusalem was devastated, laid waste, the wall was broken down, the city was in disrepair. It was really a bad situation. And um, the, the reason that was so bad is now pagan peoples from the outside are coming in and taking advantage of Jerusalem, which was the holy city. It was the capital of religion. I mean, you know, it was, it was so important in that day, and now it's just laid waste. And so um, people are going there. They're assessing the situation. Some of them are coming back to Persia and reporting what's going on. Now, that brings us to Nehemiah, who this is the setting in which we come to him. Nehemiah, at the time, is a cupbearer for the king of Persia. Now, to be a cupbearer was an awesome and amazing thing and kind of a terrible job because as the cupbearer, do you know what you did? You were the person that ate the food or drank the wine before it got to the king in case it was poisoned. Yay! So every meal, however the, often the king eats or drinks something, you're the first to go in and give the taste and make sure because oftentimes kings were poisoned by even chefs who had gotten turned against them, and people would come in and, and convince them to poison the food, and then that's how they would kill the king. So kings were very paranoid, so they had somebody called a cupbearer who checked all the food out. So here's Nehemiah. He's a cupbearer. Now, on the, the downside, obviously, you have a bad day, you're dead. So there's that. That's not a good day at work, and that's how that usually ends for you. Or at worst, you're poisoned, and then you're physically incapable of living for the rest of your life. So then on the good side, though, the cupbearer had it made. They ate the best, choicest food because you're eating what the king eats. You were the most trusted person by the king more than anybody else. The king took great care of you. He wanted you to be happy and good, and he, he wanted your loyalty, and he wanted everything. So you lived in the high, you know, best house and probably lived in some sort of a mini palace kind of a thing. And, and so Nehemiah's got it made, man. He's got a sweet setup, except for the whole die, possible dying thing. But other than that, he had a great situation going there. So here's Nehemiah living 800 miles away from his homeland, Jerusalem. And he gets word of what has happened in Jerusalem. Now I'm going to pause there because we're going to go into the scripture right now, into Nehemiah chapter 1, and, and pick it up from there and read kind of what happens here. So starting uh, in Nehemiah chapter 1, it says, The words of Nehemiah, son of Hakaliah. It's a great word. I've been practicing it. Hakaliah. In the month of Kisiev, in the 20th year, while I was in the citadel of Susa, Hanani, one of my brothers, came from Judah with some other men. And I questioned them about the Jewish remnant that had survived the exile and also about Jerusalem. So he's questioning them, what has happened in Jerusalem? Tell me, give me a report. <clears throat> they said to me, those who survived the exile and are back in the province are in great trouble and disgrace. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days, I mourned and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. So, 
Nehemiah gets word that things are not good. And the thing that he's most concerned about is that the wall has been broken down around Jerusalem. And in that day and age, walls were critical to the um, survival of the city and the people in it. And so because the wall was broken down, people were coming in. They were taking advantage of the people. They were literally stealing things out of the city. And, and just it was just a, a total chaotic situation that was going on there. And again, for, for Nehemiah or any Jew that was exiled, they were looking at this going, this is, this is horrible. They would have the same feeling about the city of Jerusalem and the state that it was in that we would have for a family member who's struggling or sick or, you know, that same kind of angst or pain that we would have for that person. That's how, that's how they would feel about their homeland. And that's how Nehemiah felt. And, um, and so, you know, inside he was broken and felt sorry and, and really um, out of the seed of this angst in his heart, though, begins one of the greatest building projects that we read of in Scripture. And one of the most important critical moves that we see. And, uh, and so basically what Nehemiah has is a burden. This vision that he's now having begins with a burden. Deep concern. In fact, it says that he's so concerned that he wept and he mourned and he fasted for several days. He didn't do anything else. He was just torn up about what was going on and he he then began to think something's got to happen. Something has to change. And so out of this burden would come something great. And so now I'm thinking about just all of us. What is our burden? You know, what, what is your burden? When you think about your life or you look around our community or this world, do you have a burden? And that's really a question for me too. You know, what is my burden? What, what is the thing that God has laid on my heart as a Christian, as somebody who's in this world, who knows everything is not right. But what is the burden that God has laid on my heart to see something change? Because really, every great move, every great change began with a burden somewhere. I think about Mother Teresa, you know, who looked at the poor and the dying in Calcutta and said, that's not good that people are dying alone and poor there. And she went and literally ministered and held people who were dying in the slums of Calcutta. I mean, she had a burden for people. Martin Luther King Jr. had a burden. He didn't like what was happening here in this country. And he had a burden which produced a vision. You know, like every great move begins sort of with a burden in our life. I read a great story. Um, it's about something that happened several years ago, but I just came across a recent about a church up in Buffalo, New York, um, a Baptist church there that the, when the pastor moved to town, he was a new pastor in this town at one point, he noticed that the community was uh, just kind of in shambles. The murder rate was high. The drug use was high. Um, there were a lot of people who were unemployed. And, uh, and he just was, thought this was unacceptable. And he went to his church leaders. They decided it was un unacceptable. So they all agreed to do something about the problem in their own community. And you know what they did? They bought a Subway franchise. That is, of course, what you do when you look at a burden. You say, buy a Subway franchise. So they buy the Subway sandwich shop franchise because they wanted to provide a business that would actually employ people and do all this kind of stuff. Well, interestingly enough, you remember the show Undercover Boss, which is where the Subway CEO goes to their stores and acts like he's an employee of the store and, and works with people and then goes, ta-da, I'm the CEO, and everybody, oh, you know. Anyway, so that's, that show came to that Subway at the church. And, and the CEO went there to see what was going on and was so blown away by what he had discovered. And so he sat down to talk to the pastor to find out what in the world is going on here. And, and um, so the pastor told him this. The pastor's name is Darius Pridgen. Um, it's True Bethel Baptist Church. He said the reason that we actually put it in the church was because there weren't a lot of opportunities in this neighborhood when I got here. There was a high murder rate. There were a lot of people not working. So a lot of people would say, Hey, just give people jobs. And he would say, well, that's not the key. If they haven't been trained, how can they work? So we started collecting an offering at our church. We called it the franchise offering. We have never taken a franchise offering here. We should try that. <laughs> Do I get to pick what it is? I'm okay with Subway, but there's lots of other... Anyway, anyway, I'll talk about that later. But he said, you know, we started this franchise offering. Um, and he said, uh, so we took up the money to, to buy the franchise, and he said, but you know what, we've got to do more than just build a business. We have got to train people, we have to push people to the next level of their life so that their life can change, so our community can change. You know, he was thinking this bigger picture of what could happen through this one small move of one at a time, training and employing people. 
So that's what he started doing. Now, the CEO, when he got done with his visit at this particular subway, he said, you know what, we're going to waive the franchise fee for you guys. And he said, and also, I want to help you start another one in another community. So they started another subway in another community because it needed help and uh, decided to make that happen. Then the CEO goes back to his executives and holds up these subways and says, this is a potential model of subway for us. Now, how about that? All started, I guess, from just the pastor who first said, this is not acceptable, what's going on here? The leadership of the church looked at everything and said, you're right, this is a problem, somebody's got to do something. Well, who's the somebody? That would be us. What should we do? I don't know how they came across subway, but anyway, subway sounded good, and so they started something. I love that. The burden. It all started with a burden. Something is not right here. And therefore, if something is not right here, something needs to change. And if something's going to change, somebody should start that change. And who's the somebody? You know, maybe just as we kind of look, just even in our own lives, you know, it's like, what is the burden that is on me right now? Maybe it starts with something small and simple in your life. Maybe it's, maybe it's your physical life. Maybe you're saying, new year, new me, baby. New abs, new guns, new something. You know, I'm going to be healthier this year. I'm going to eat right. I'm going to do the things that I didn't do last year. I'm going to do them better this year, you know. Well, you know what? If that is your burden, then what are you going to do about that? Are you going to make a commitment today to make a change there? What about your family? You know, maybe... Maybe your marriage, maybe you have a burden to make your marriage better than it was last year and the year before that. Okay, well, what are you going to do about that? Spending time with your kids, you know, what is that going to look like? Or maybe broaden that out a little bit. You have a burden for others in this community. Well, who are the others and what is the burden? And, you know, don't leave that burden just sitting there. Make a commitment to doing something about that. And, and I think that that's so important that we move just from not just being sorry about the situation or not just being compassionate, but actually saying, you know what, this burden should compel me to do something else. And oftentimes, what goes along with a burden is a passion for something. You know, to be passionate about making a change happen, looking at it going, this is not good. I think about John Wesley, you know, the guy who started Methodism. You know, there was a point in his life where he looked at the whole world and said, this world must change. That's a pretty big thought. But he said, you know what, the world is my parish. In other words, the world is my church. The world is the people that I'm going to preach to is the whole world. He had this grand vision of changing. So he starts preaching in the coal mines in England and starts bringing hundreds and thousands to Christ, develops this incredible discipleship process. It becomes a movement called Methodism, which moves to the United States and blows up all over the United States. And, you know, the result of that is that, you know, not only have millions of churches sprung up over the years, but hospitals and schools and so many other things have affected our society as a result of one man who had this burden. And it is said um, that this quote is attributed to him. I don't, nobody's really 100% sure about that, but at least the quote applies to him. It says, light yourself on fire with passion and people will come for miles to watch you burn. Kind of gross, but it's a good, cool thought, you know, that like <clears throat> when you get on fire with passion about something, it's amazing how that begins to change another person who watches you get so passionate. They look at you and they go, man, he or she is so passionate and fired up. I want that, or I want to be a part of that, or maybe I need to look at my life, figure out what my passion is, but nonetheless, you know, there's something about having a burden and allowing God to weld that into a passion that moves us to do something. That's what Nehemiah had, this passion to go back and, and make something that wasn't right, right. Now, the next thing that happened with Nehemiah that also relates to us is he didn't just plow forward and start doing whatever he wanted to do to make it happen. He did the next right thing, which was to pray. That was the next right thing for him to do. When you go back to verse 4 in, in uh, chapter 1, he said, When I heard these things, I sat down and wept. For some days I mourned and fasted. So that's the burden. Then I prayed before the God of heaven. There's not a step that we can take that is more important after we have this burden or vision than praying about it. What is this thing that I need to do, God? Well, I'm going to lay it before you, because if it's not your will, then what's the point of moving forward anyway, right? It can't just be our good idea after eating some bad pizza the night before, you know. It's just like, we can't just start plowing forward. We have to say, God, does this measure up with what you're calling me to do? Is this what you want me to do? And is this the first step I need to take, you know, like laying it out all before the Lord? And for Nehemiah, his big step was a big one. He had to go to the king and ask for permission to leave and not be the cupbearer to go back to Jerusalem 
to see this vision carried out. And you know what that meant? He wasn't sure how the king was going to react. You know, it's possible that the king would get mad, maybe even get furious. How dare you ask to leave me? You're my trusted person. Maybe the, the king would get paranoid and think, oh, are you going to gonna do something, cause an uprising against me because you know all the inside stuff here? I mean, you know, the king could actually have had him killed just for asking that one simple request. And so this was kind of a life or death thing for Nehemiah to go to the king and ask this. And so specifically, when you go to verse 11 in chapter 1, he's praying to the Lord and he says, Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this, your servant, and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man, this man being the king. God, this is not going to happen if the king doesn't let me go. And I really believe that you can influence the king to let me go. So I'm going to start with you. <laughs> because in the end, you're the one who's going to make this happen. Same thing in our lives. When we begin to do something, we're like, Lord, all my eggs are in one basket. That's with you. I trust you for my life, my career, my family. Whatever's going on with me, I choose to start with you. And, you know, I, I'm reminded that prayer is not something we do that's just a one-time shot. It's not something we do that when we find ourselves in a bind, you know, or we just, oh, now I have to pray. It's not that kind of thing. It's this continual conversation. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, one of the shortest verses in the Bible. Two words. Pray. How often? I'm sorry, what was that? Continually. How often is that? It's like all the time. That's like I wake up in the morning, and then the first thing I'm doing is praying, God, today, whatever you want from me today, Whatever struggles I'm already in my mind thinking I got today, I'm going to give them to you. Today, I give it to you. And then throughout the day, it's this constant conversation. And, and I know sometimes if we've never done that, we think that's weird or hard, but it's really not. You know, it's just constantly keeping God in the forefront of our mind as we're doing whatever we're doing and asking God to help us throughout that day until we get to bed. And then we're done. We're praying. And then it's the next day. It's this constant conversation with God, inviting him into every part of our life. And in doing so, it's like we're placing God as the number one priority above everything else and trusting that he can handle our life. And, you know, when we don't do that, we get so overwhelmed and so distracted by so many other things. You know, we're just, we're just walking around and, and hoping that we're going in this right direction. We're just believing that my efforts are going to make this happen, and, and who knows what we're getting into at that point. Um, it's like being distracted by your cell phone. I know I always refer to our cell phones, but I just think it's funny, our culture right now. And we love our cell phones. We look at them all the time. In fact, um, in Austria, Salzburg, Austria, um, there's uh, this great statistic that they've come out with. It's not really great, but in, their, in this town, they have discovered that 40% of the injured pedestrians involved in accidents were injured because they were distracted by a cell phone device. 40% of their pedestrian accidents. You know what they call these the people who just sit there like this and run into stuff? Smartphone zombies. Smartphone zombies. It's people who are walking around constantly. They have so much footage from their security cameras of people who walk into light poles because of looking at their phones or almost getting run over by cars, but mostly light poles. They have put airbags on their light poles. <clears throat> airbags on their light poles. This is how bad we are, people. This is this. Smartphone zombies. Walking around running the light poles. On the airbag, they wrote, it's essentially translated like this. Will the next car also be so well padded? Anyway, I don't know. But that's what it says on the light poles and people running into them. And I guess they're saying if you were to run into a car, would it be so padded when they hit you and you get knocked over? Whatever. The whole point is so distracted by smartphones that nothing else needs to be even people's own safety. But in crazy ways, we can do that just with our own life, just continually plowing through life and then going, oh, yeah, God, by the way, now that I'm in this problem or crisis, can you come help me? Otherwise, I'm mostly distracted by just doing what I want to do. Like, no, how can we be so focused on God that we're taking steps naturally along the path of our life with him always out in front of us, not distracted, praying first and inviting God to guide us and lead us and direct us. And then the last thing that, that happens here is that Nehemiah doesn't just leave it as a burden. He doesn't just pray and then sit there and go, okay, God, work out the whole thing. He actually has to get up and do something. So he gets up and he goes to the king. This going to the king was probably harder than rebuilding the wall, all total. This was the one that was the hardest move for him. And so he gets up and he goes to the king. We pick this up in Nehemiah 2, 4 through 6. 
It says, then I prayed to the God of heaven. This was like that one last prayer before you go in and do something hard. And I answered the king, if it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in his sight, let him send me to the city in Judah, <coughs> excuse me, where my ancestors are buried so that I can rebuild it. So there's the ask, dun 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 drama. Then the king, with the queen sitting beside him, asked me, how long will your journey take? When will you get back? And I love this. It pleased the king to send me, and so I set a time. The response of the king was not, I'm angry, I'm mad, why are you doing this to me, how could you do this? But just two questions of clarification. How long is it going to take and when will you be back? Because I want you to come back. But I think maybe the king already knew that there was a burden laid on Nehemiah. I think that he already knew that at some point Nehemiah was going to come to him. But God had influenced that king's heart in such a way to say, you know what, Nehemiah? Yes, I want you to go. You should go bring honor to your people. You should go back and help rebuild that city and God had favor on him I love that I love how that story is playing out right here and can you imagine Nehemiah the relief that was in his heart and on his mind when the king said that I mean you know just thank the Lord that he's not going to kill me you know it's a good day this job is too hard but you know anyway so he's like it's, it's a good day and you know he really trusted the Lord he he did what to do he was obedient knowing the risk and all these kinds of things but but trusting that God was with him. And it's like this trust in God and his burden went hand in hand, knowing that God was going to take care of him and he was going to help him deal with this burden. And you know, I'm glad that when I look in scripture that like Jesus, not only did he just have compassion on this world, he had a burden. He had a burden for people. Man, you can see it all throughout his time here, how he healed people and fed people and loved people and showed people the way and the truth. But only that, the burden, the biggest burden was he looked at death and sin and said, this is not acceptable. This is ravaging people. And so instead of just sitting there and saying, boy, I'm so compassionate. I have such a struggle for these people. He did something. What did he do? He went to the cross. Aren't you glad he did something? <laughs> you know, he looked at the problem and said, I am the answer to this problem. And he went to the cross to make it right. And we're all grateful that he did. And you know, so for all of us, as I think about our life and how we're carrying that out, we're all going to end up somewhere in life. You know, what's that going to look like? If we begin with the end in mind, when we, we look at our life and we play out the years that are ahead, what do we want to see accomplished? What do we want to say, God, do that thing in me, whatever that is. I have a burden, I have a gift, I have a passion. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, this is the thing that you've laid on my heart. So Lord, help me make this happen and maybe it begins today with just a question of God what am I burdened for maybe that's the first step and it's those questions on your card what burden is God placing on my heart for others and and then what am I going to do about it these are the two questions today that I really am asking you if there's a next step I want you to take that would be it wrestle with these questions this morning and maybe throughout this week and then let God begin to work on you and me together as we pray about whatever that thing is that God needs us to do. Amen? Let's pray.